Hello and welcome back to The Three Princes of Serendip by Elizabeth Jameson Hodges from an old Persian folk tale about a land that we now know as Sri Lanka. Uh, we've got three princes that have been sent out by their father, King Jaya of Serendip, to uh, <clears throat> find a formula to uh, rid his country of the threat of sea dragons that have been imposing very much discomfort upon them and actually have brought King Jaya to a state of horrible illness at this time. Uh, the princes are as determined as ever to continue in their quest uh, to find Aphonicius, the old seer, uh, who's able to wear many different disguises as he wanders, never spends more than one night in one place, and uh, can even turn into a bird with fiery eyes. This is a long chapter, so make yourself comfortable. Here we go with Chapter 8, The Emperor's Malady. The princes of Serendip journeyed happy in the knowledge that they had recovered the mirror of justice. But once more in Persia, other travelers met them with distressing news about Emperor Vahram. One said, Our ruler must be very ill, because for a long time there have been no great feasts in the palace. A second said, His imperial majesty must indeed be sorely afflicted, for they say he allows no music in his hearing. A third said, Surely he must be suffering grievously, for no longer does he appear before his people to hear in person that justice is done. Much disturbed by these reports, the three princes nevertheless had to travel slowly on camels as they crossed the desert. Then, mounted once more upon horses, the brothers rode swiftly again until they reached the village called Kuabad. Since their horses were too tired to go further that day, the three brothers, although anxious to see the emperor, decided to rest overnight in the village. Because they had paused here twice before in their travels, they were remembered by the people. The people had also heard by word of mouth the conquest of the hand and of how the mirror of justice was being returned. Hence the princes were welcomed by all the people. The Dequan, who was the headman of the village, invited them to stay at his house. Here they were given a supper of eggplant, sweet rice, and purple grapes, while their host invited all the principal men of the place to come and visit. At first the men asked the three brothers about their adventures in India, to which the brothers replied both briefly and modestly. Then the faces of the elders became dark with anxiety as they spoke of the emperor's illness. We are told that the imperial physicians have done their utmost, one said, yet like a ragged cloak on a beggar's back a doleful malady still clings about our ruler. And more alarming yet, the Dequan said, a rumor reached us only yesterday that Dahak, a monstrous serpent with three heads, has broken free from his prison on Mount Damavand. There he was chained long ago by our ancestors, but now, hiding in dark groves and behind great rocks, it is said he advances steadily upon the capital at Bishapur. To what purpose do you think? Balakrama asked. Why, surely, to break the emperor's will by seizing, if he can, the glorious standard of imperial power, the leathern apron of the blacksmith Kawa. It was he who raised the rebellion by which Dahak was conquered long ago. But if this new rumor is true, the evil serpent, now wild with freedom, wishes to possess the standard's power and make himself the emperor. What can be done? asked Raja Singha. Have the imperial guards been sent to destroy him? Many times, the Dequan said, for the stories about him have been as numerous as ravens in the summer, but none have found the serpent, though his three heads are each as large as a lion's, and his body moves but slowly along the earth. What more can be done? asked Raja Singha. We do not know, the Dequan said, but some days ago an elderly traveler who stopped here but a single night spoke on the matter. 
Dahak cannot be conquered by the sword of a palace guard, he said, for this treacherous serpent with a flick of the long tongue in any of his heads can cause a man to fall into sleep as deep as the ocean for a night and a day. How then may he be overcome, I asked. Dahak's power lies in three long necks which support his three great heads, the old man said. His eyes were shining with excitement, bright as new moons, while he went on. Only if these be twisted together like three strands in one cord can Dahak be subdued. Then he would be weakened and the imperial bird could carry him away. This bird, the Dequan said to the princes, is she who is called the Simurg. Preening her long tail feathers of blue, green, and rose, she sits day and night on the roof of the palace and guards our emperor. The Dequan looked thoughtful. It seems, he said, that the old traveler has described the sole way to thwart the wily Dahak from his purpose, but this appears so difficult, we can only hope that the tale of the monster's escape is simply rumor. The three brothers had given each other quick glances while the Dequan was speaking. When he finished, Balakrama said, I am with you in that hope, but tell us more about the old man with whom you spoke. He may be one for whom we seek. As I remember, the headman said, he was dressed much as a farmer in a brown tunic and dark trousers. On his right arm he wore an iron bracelet incised with a design of stars. Those in the house where he stayed said he slept but little and mumbled in his sleep. But by morning he seemed well rested and never had they seen anyone with brighter eyes. How like a Phoenicius, Vijayo said. Pray, which way did he go as he left this village? Now that leads me to relate a strange thing, the Dequan said, for although he spoke his farewells and thanks, none of us saw him setting out. How then can we follow him, Raja Singha said to his brothers, when there are as many directions as there are winds to blow in them? To this all agreed, and soon the gathering dispersed. The next morning before departing, the princes thanked their host profusely and attempted to give him a jeweled ring in gratitude for his hospitality, but he graciously refused it. Our village has been more than rewarded by the honor of your visit, he said, for you who have recovered the mirror of justice are like stars making bright the lanes of our small village. You give us too much praise, Balakrama said, but at least allow us to present you with a token of our friendship. Saying this, he handed to the chief villager a peacock feather he had brought from India. It was the very same one he had used for protection against Asura. May it serve you well as it once shielded me, said Balakrama, and if ever we can be of assistance to you or your people, pray, send it to us. At these words, the Dequan of Kuhabad bowed very low and accepted the green-blue feather. Then the three princes continued on their way to the capital of the Emperor Varam. The young men crossed valleys with woodlands of sycamore and poplar trees growing by mountain streams. They climbed many high and rocky hills, and at last they reached Bishapur, the capital. <clears throat> there they first sought Zamis, the grand keeper of the royal orders, of whom they inquired concerning the emperor and to whom they turned over the mirror of justice. Also, after revealing their royal names and telling him that they were sons of the king of Serendip, the brothers said that provided their fa father approved, a marriage had been arranged between Raja Singha and Queen Parvati, the fair young queen of India. As soon as this news reached the emperor, he asked Zamis to bring the princes before him. The brothers were shocked and dismayed to see how much their friend had changed. Although the emperor was still a young man, his face was creased with worry, drawn with grief, and pale with illness. Only by a great effort could he speak to the princes at all, and even then was not able to raise his head. Ill as I am, he said, for you my gratitude has flowered like the peach blossom, which seems with its beauty to thank the sunlight and the rain. I rejoice that you have so gloriously succeeded in the purpose of your journey, and I am glad to welcome you as sons of my old friend, the King of Serendip. The three princes bowed low, and the emperor continued to speak. In spite of this pleasure, however, he said, your highnesses find me exceedingly ill. 
Indeed, unless your genius can discover a cure, I believe I shall die very soon. The brothers bowed again, and Balakrama said, Our hearts are grieved to see you thus. It will be our earnest endeavor to help if we can. May we ask whence came this malady which has driven the light and joy from your imperial majesty's eyes? Questioned in this way, Varam spoke sadly to the princes of Delhi Rama and told how, in a moment of fury, he had caused her to be driven into the wilderness. At this point, his eyes filled with tears of such bitter regret that he covered his face with his hands. I know not how I could have been so cruel, even in anger to one so fair, he said. My palace guards have searched for her in vain. Surely by now some fierce beast must have consumed her, and behold the wretched plight to which I am reduced. When the three princes heard this tale, their hearts were filled with pity both for Delhi Rama, whom they had never seen, and for the emperor Varam, whose suffering was plainly visible. <clears throat> Since your majesty asks our counsel, Balakrama said, permit us to withdraw and consult among ourselves so that we may discover what we should advise. Granted this request, the three brothers left the emperor's apartment, and as soon as possible Vijayo sought an audience with the princess Purandot. She was robed in white with a girdle of gold and looked as fair as the Narcissus, but her delicate face was drawn with worry. I rejoice to see you, she said. But all my happiness is dimmed by my brother's illness. Not only is, is his imperial majesty sadly ailing, but word has reached us that Dahak, a serpent of evil with three horrible heads, has broken out of the cave in which he once was chained. Even now, it is said, he approaches the capital. No doubt he wishes to wrest from my brother the imperial standard, and even the golden throne itself. Here she wrung her hands, and tears flowed down her cheeks. Surely you can help us, she said. I have long been living with that hope. When Vijayo repeated this to Balakrama and Raja Singha, they were very solemn and went immediately to a window to look at the imperial standard. It flew from a tall pole in the great courtyard of the palace. A leathern apron such as any blacksmith might use, but fastened by golden cords. At the foot of the pole were three palace guards. Higher than the flag itself, on a corner of the roof, the princes also saw the emperor's great bird, the old Simurg. She had long talons and was preening her feathers, which glowed with colors blue like the sky, green like the grass, and rose like a sunset. Seeing the imperial standard guarded thus, the three brothers next consulted among themselves for some way to relieve the suffering of the emperor Varam. Finding a remedy for an affliction of the heart is not so easy as finding a stray camel, Balakrama said. Nor uncovering an ugly plot, said Vijayo. Nor facing the fearsome hand, added Raja Singha. All day the brothers walked up and down in their fine palace apartments and thought and thought, without success. When night came they slept uneasily, and finally with the dawn they decided to ride up to the top of a nearby mountain, where they might be away from other people and the noise of the town to think in peace. Here they dismounted and looked out upon the valley and trees below. They thought of the great capital with its luxurious palace and grieving emperor, and they thought of the small village of Kuabad with its few comforts but many smiles. Finally, Balakrama said, Since his imperial majesty is ill with sorrow, perhaps a taste of happiness would lift his spirits. After weighing this thought with care, the three brothers agreed upon a plan. Though with scant hope of much success, then they returned to the palace and asked to see the emperor again. When they were admitted to his presence, they bowed very low, and Balakrama said, All around this capital are many valleys with prospects of exquisite beauty and wholesome air. In order to recover your majesty's health, we suggest the building of a palace in each of seven different places of this kind. Let them be pleasing in design and handsome in appointments. When they are completed, visit a different one each day for the seven days. Besides this, the second prince said, we recommend that as soon as orders are given for the palaces to be built, ambassadors be sent into seven of the greatest countries of the world to invite here seven princesses, daughters of mighty monarchs. Let each of them, with her maids in waiting, visit in a different palace to delight your imperial majesty with royal conversation. Finally, 
Prince Rajasinghe said, We respectfully suggest that your majesty ask to come hither to the greatest storyteller in each of the seven largest cities of this land. Let one of these visit in each palace, so that the telling of stories may help to drive away the unhappiness which long has made your majesty so ill. By this time, the emperor was in such great despair over all the prescriptions that were not helping, and was so full of confidence in the wisdom of the three princes of Serendip, that he immediately decided to accept their counsel. He ordered his architects to commence work at once on seven palaces, each to be situated in a spot with a pleasant prospect and healthful air. Also, he commanded seven ambassadors to depart for audiences with seven mighty monarchs, to ask that each permit one of his fairest daughters to visit in the land of Persia. Finally, word was sent to the seven largest cities of the empire, saying that the emperor Vavram desired the services of the greatest storyteller living in each. All of these commands were executed with remarkable speed. So expert were the emperor's architects and builders that the seven palaces were completed at the, t at the same time and with incredible swiftness. Each was magnificent and pleasingly different from the others in both design and furnishings. Moreover, every one was filled with enough rice, wheat, and other provisions to last the imperial court for several months, in case the emperor should wish to prolong his visit in any one of them. Hardly were the palaces ready when the ambassadors returned from distant lands with seven princesses, all fair like the moment of dawn, gentle in speech and royally accomplished. As each arrived with her ladies-in-waiting, splendid horses and handsome equipage, crowds thronged into the streets to see the bright processions. People waved in welcome and called out words of gratitude to the fair maidens who had traveled so far to help the ailing emperor. After each princess reached the capital, the three brothers sought out the ambassador who had been sent to bring her and asked if he had noted any signs of Dahak, the evil serpent. None of them, however, had the least news of the monster until the seventh one arrived. We did not see him, this ambassador said, but we were still twenty parasongs from here. We heard a great hissing, which sounded like a mighty wind, and indeed a storm arose. Fearful that Dahak had caused this disturbance and that he might appear at any moment to frighten the princess, we hurried on. Soon the seven storytellers also arrived. Young and popular, they too were welcomed by great throngs in the imperial city. Questioned by the princess concerning the Dahak, none had ought to report until the seventh reached Bishop Hur. This one said, Ten par songs away, as I traveled hither, I saw at dusk a grove of sycamores. Entwined along the trunk of one of these trees, there seemed to be something dark, like a thick coil of black rope. It, it had three heads, and from the mouth of each issued fiery sparks. Perhaps there I saw Dahak, but I did not dare to stop. The princes were much disturbed by these reports. They informed Zamis, and he sent out the palace guards again and again to look for the great serpent, but nowhere did they find him. Little rain had fallen that year, and it was near the end of summer. In the farmlands beyond the city, the struggling wheat plants were so dry that they seemed to wail in complaint as the evening winds rustled through their stiff stalks. Many of the people in Bishapur were fearful for the harvest, but they greeted the visitors with smiles. When at last all was in readiness, a day was fixed for the emperor to travel to the first palace. On the night before, the three princes were making ready to accompany him. It was late, but they had not yet gone to bed when they heard three curious thuds, as if as many men had fallen to the ground. The sounds came from the courtyard. The brothers hurried to a window. Outside, the moonlight touched everything with a veil of silver. By this light, the princes were able to see the pole bearing the imperial standard, and to their horror they could clearly discern a huge serpent entwined about it. The serpent had three great heads. Here's a picture of the serpent. Let's see if we can get that good for you there. Somewhat. Yeah, look at that. And I'll continue now with the description. And use your imagination <clears throat> to add color to the image. Bursts of flame as its body spirals slowly upwards. Below, slumped to the ground, lay three guards. The three princes hurried to the courtyard. There, hardly breathing, they hid themselves in a dark shadow. 
Dahak, with his heads thrust out in three directions, continued to slither higher and higher up the pole, with slow but steady speed. Finally, placing the end of his tail on the ground, he pulled upward on the pole with his strong coils until it was uprooted and the imperial standard fell with a dull flop to the earth. So amazed were the three princes that for a few moments they could only watch and feel a fear within them they had not known before. Then they saw another extraordinary thing. Dahak's great body unwound itself from the lowered pole. Soon he held it in three different places by the three mouths of his three great heads. Raising the standard, slowly he began to crawl off with the pole over his back, and moving slowly with it was the blacksmith's apron. Now was the moment to act. While grasping the pole in his mouth, Dahak could not attack with his dart-like tongues, and the princes felt sure he was too greedy for power to drop the pole. In a long bound, Rajasinga jumped upon his tail. Balakrama seized the pole near the standard. Vijayo grabbed the pole at the other end. While the three heads still held on to the pole, the two other brothers walked swiftly around and around, so the long necks were twisted until they looked until they looked like strands of a giant rope. This done, the princes could remove the standard to a safe place and bind Dahak's great necks together with the golden cords which had held the apron of the blacksmith Kawa. Only then did the serpent slump to the earth. His greedy heads at last relaxed their hold on the long pole, and the princes bent to pick it up. Then the powerful Simurg flew down from the roof of the palace, her great wings like dark fans spread out in the night. Grasping the enormous snake in her tremendous claws, she flew up into the air with a loud screech. The princess, the princess saw her circling off with the silver moonlight on her back, while sparks of fire dropped from the three wide mouths of Dahak. The palace guards, who had fallen at the foot of the pole, still lay as if asleep. Other guards, awakened by the screech of the imperial bird, now ran into the courtyard. When they learned what had happened, they mounted their horses to follow the old Simurg and her prey. By early dawn they returned and said that after flying in great circles, she had dropped Dahak on a nearby peak. Here the guards had speedily loaded him with fetters and chained him once more in a mountain cave. As for the three men who had been put to sleep by the tongues in the three giant heads, they did not wake up until the following night. When the emperor heard how Dahak had been conquered, he was again full of gratitude towards his three friends from Serendip. As long as you reside in my empire, he said, yours shall be the right of access to my imperial person without announcement. By this permission, I trust you will understand the depths of my gratitude and the confidence I place in your royal highnesses. Then, with apparently more spirit than he had shown before, Varam prepared to visit the first palace. For this occasion, he had himself clothed in a garment of golden cloth and wore a cap with threads of gold and jeweled ornaments in a design of crescents and peacocks. All of his courtiers, and the three princes of Serendip, were similarly dressed in robes of golden cloth. Even the bridles of the horses were decked with rosettes of gold ribbon, which shone in the sunlight like bright stars against their dark heads. Although the imperial procession to the first palace was as magnificent as the people had ever seen, the emperor himself was so weak that he had to be carried by litter. His short, dark beard was combed and neatly curled, but the long illness had made his eyes dull and his face pale as a white rose. When his subjects saw this, they cried out, Ah! in pity and then in hope, May your majesty's health soon be restored. Long live our emperor! Warmed by their sympathy and encouraged by their hope, Varam finally arrived at the first palace. Since he could not sit up without suffering, he asked to be placed on a couch. Resting in the great courtyard, he admired the graceful arches of the palace and the garden it surrounded. Here were newly planted trees of peach and apricot, also a wide pool reflecting the flight of mountain birds. Before long, a warm and gusty breeze sprang up, which made the trees sway like dancers. The three princes, hearing the sound of hissing in the wind, feared that Dahak, even though chained in a cave, had blown up a great storm, so they urged his imperial majesty to go inside for safety. The interior of the palace and its furnishings were ornamented with fine gold. This, in turn, was inlaid with African diamonds and pearls from cool ledges of the Indian Ocean. In the great hall, the three brothers saw the first princess as she came forth to welcome the emperor. 
Gracefully gowned in cloth of gold, she entered the hall to the sound of stringed instruments, which were played by her twelve ladies-in-waiting. Each was so accomplished that the music was full of enchantment. With a charming smile, the princess bowed to the ailing emperor and said, My heart is distressed to see your majesty so ill, but all rejoices to welcome your imperial splendor into this abode of magnificence and serenity. Bahram, pleased to be greeted by so lovely and gracious a lady, said, I doubt not that your royal highness's sympathy and courtesy will soon have a happy effect upon my health. With all my heart, therefore, I thank your highness for traveling far from your own land to aid in my recovery. After that, the princess and the emperor talked for a long while. They exchanged many agreeable remarks. Some of hers made Varam, and as he was, smile just a little. Then the royal visitor and all her ladies-in-waiting withdrew, and his imperial majesty summoned the first storyteller. A young man, who knew more tales than anyone else in his home city, arrived and bowed very low. When Varam signified he had permission to speak, the storyteller said, <clears throat> It grieves me sorely to see your majesty so ill, but I hope the adventure I can relate will beguile your imperial sovereign.